Great job, Karen Studi, doing leading the state. Wouldn't you say? Big round of applause. I love doing this. I love coming to state capitals all across the country, standing here in the rotundas, looking up, being awed by the beauty, by the splendor. And all of this in your honor. Because we think of these as our seats of government, but they're really the people's house. A lot of times we get disconnected from these places. Maybe we come to them and we're intimidated. How many people are here for the first time at your state capitol? Raise your hand. Thank you guys for being here today. There's a, there's a tendency to come to a place like this and to walk around and be so awed that we forget that these places belong to us. From here to New York to California and everywhere in between, including contrary to what they seem to think in Washington, D.C. today, these houses, the people's houses, belong to us. And I think it's important that we come here that we feel that, we feel that sense of ownership, that we know that when we walk these halls in this beautiful building with so much history, and we meet with our legislators, that they work for us. I can tell you, having traveled to 48 states in the last three years, 18 states now just in the last three months, that you are very blessed to live in this great state, that in this state, your legislators inherently understand that they work for you. When I first started in politics about 11 years ago, I had a feeling about politicians, maybe some of you share this feeling about politicians. I won't fully vocalize it, but let's just say they weren't high on my list. And I still feel that way mostly about folks in Washington, D.C., but having been to so many state legislatures, and here in particular, I have an entirely different feeling about the men and women that serve here in your house and in your Senate. And what I can tell you is, whether we agree or disagree, whatever party they belong to, whatever ideology they profess, generally speaking, they're here for the right reason. They're here because they felt called to serve. They're here because they believed in their state and they knew somebody had to step up and do the right thing, which is to run for office. It's not easy to run for office. It's not easy to win, campaign, it's hard on your family. It's definitely not easy to be a sitting state legislator. These folks take a lot of abuse. You know, we tend to criticize them very heavily when they don't do what we want them to do. And when they do what we want them to do, we tend not to pay very much attention, right? They don't get a lot of thanks. It really is the quintessential thankless job. But for me, having traveled so far and wide across this country and met so many incredible state legislators, I'm very thankful to them. I want you to know that when I think about the founders and who they were and what they stood for, the framers, I think about and read their stories, they were state legislators. They served in colonial governments, on town councils, on county councils, exactly the same as your state legislators. People who serve in your county government or your city councils. So don't distance yourself too much from the founders. And when you look at your state legislator, think about they're walking in those shoes. And they're doing the best they can to walk in those shoes. So I'd like to start by honoring the state legislators, the senators, the members of the House of Representatives here in your legislature today. A big round of applause for them. They, as a group, are the second most important people in this building today. The most important people in the building today are sitting in this audience. They're the people who put this event together. They're the volunteers, some from all over the country, who participated in helping with all of this. Because they are the fabric of America. You know, we don't know the stories of most of the people who've made American history. We read history, we read Washington and Adams and Jefferson. We know these stories, right? Madison, Patrick Henry speaking, give me liberty or give me death. We know those stories, but we don't know the stories of the average people who made America so extraordinary. And there are many more of them, and their stories are just as extraordinary, but mostly lost to history. America is a country built by ordinary people who were extraordinary when it called for it. One of my favorite stories from American history is a story of a great patriot by the name of Captain Levi Preston. Preston was there when the shot was fired that was heard around the world. 
He came out to serve, he came to fight the Redcoats, and the only reason we know Levi Preston's story, and most of you won't have heard of Levi Preston, the reason we know is because there was a young historian traveling the country by the name of Mellon Chamberlain in 1843. In 1843, the war is long over. In fact, the last remaining Minutemen are in their late 80s and early 90s. Today, we all know people in that age range. Back then, that's Methuselah old, right? Everybody knew, if you had a guy that was 85, 90 years old living in your town, everybody knew him and everybody knew Captain Preston. So when Mill and Chamberlain came to town to interview the last remaining Minutemen, they pointed him at Levi Preston. And he went to ask him a series of questions about the American Revolution and why he had fought. And he asked him, did you fight because of the Stamp Act? You were so frustrated by the idea of having to buy these stamps, taxation without representation. You were so angry about that that you went out to fight the Redcoats. Captain Preston said, stamps? Governor Bernard locked him in the armory and I'm sure I never bought one. So he says, what about the tea tax? I'm sure you were angry about the high taxes on British tea. He said, son, I was a farmer. We drank coffee, we never drank no tea. So it wasn't the Stamp Act, it wasn't the tea tax, these are the things I learned in school. And so we asked him about the great revolutionary writers, maybe he was reading Burke or Thomas Paine Common Sense. And Captain Preston said, those men you speak of, I know not their names. We read the Bible, Psalms, some of us read the Almanac, but those men, I don't know them. So now you can imagine Mellon Chamberlain has just exhausted what he knew about the causes of the Revolutionary War. All the things that you and I learned in school about the Revolutionary War. So he goes big and he says, well, maybe it was just the heavy hand of British tyranny. We were sick and tired of living under British tyranny. And Preston said, tyranny? Never felt a whit of it. No tyranny, no tea tax, no stamp back, no inspiration by the great revolutionary writers. So Chamberlain says, well, what was it? Why would you go out to fight the Redcoats if none of those things were true? Levi Preston says something that to me is the greatest summary of the political philosophy of the American Revolution that I've ever heard, then or since. And he said this, when we went out to fight them Redcoats that day, we meant only one thing. We had always governed ourselves. And we always intended to. And them Redcoats, well, they intended that we should. That's it. It's not complex, it's not lofty, it's not fancy speak. It was just a farmer who said, I'm going to tell my family what to do. We're going to govern ourselves. I'm going to run my own life. I'm going to run my own business. We're going to run our own government. You come here, you think you're going to tell us what to do. That's not going to happen. And by the way, he was living in a lineage of a long line of people who had done that 158 years since Jamestown, five generations, his country, his countrymen, his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, and so on, had governed themselves. So by the time it comes to the American Revolution, it's just unthinkable that England could tell him what to do. It was unthinkable. He's your forefather. I often think about the founding, and I think about Madison how smart he was and how well read he was. I think about Jefferson, <coughs> what a statesman. Franklin, how he knew everything about everything. Such a renaissance man. Washington, the indispensable man. And then I look in the mirror and I think, that's not me. I'm just a guy. What could I possibly do? And then I think about Levi Preston. And I think, you know what? I could be Levi Preston. Because I can govern myself, and when the time comes, I can stand, and I can fight. And that's what we're doing. And that's why it's so important to me to be here with you, because you're all Levi Preston. And I hope if you get only one thing out of this today, that when you go home today and afterwards, when you're standing in front of the mirror tonight, and you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you think, I'm Levi Preston. I can be Levi Preston. Because Levi Preston saved this country and thousands and thousands like him, and it's the only thing that has ever saved the United States of America. Every time this country is in crisis, Levi Preston stands, one, and then tens, and then hundreds, and then thousands, and tens of thousands, and millions, and Levi Preston stands and leads the charge on the battlefield. And that's who you are, and that's your heritage, and that belongs to you. You ever sit at home and you watch TV, and you watch some guy in Washington, D.C., his name might 
be Fauci or something, and he's telling you what you got to do, and you're thinking, oh, hell no, you're not going to tell me what to do. Anybody think that? That, my friends, that, my friends, is a little Levi Preston rising in your blood, just boiling in your blood. You got that inside of you. And you got that inside of you, whether your relatives, your ancestors go all the way back to the Mayflower, or you just got here, and you said the words, I am an American. You swore allegiance to this country. That is in your DNA in this country. And that's what we're fighting for here with Convention of States. There are people in Washington, D.C., and they've been there for a very long time, probably at least 115 years, who think that you're stupid, and you're simple, and that you can't be trusted with your own lives. And they think that they can, should, and they think they will tell you what to do. What do you guys say to the people in Washington, D.C. that think that they can tell you what to do? No. No, absolutely not. They can't tell you what to do unless you let them, unless we let them. We're at a time when it's just overwhelming the amount of stuff they can, think they can tell you to do. And the founders knew that this moment would come. On September 15, 1787, George Mason from your Virginia, Colonel George Mason, stands and he addresses the Constitutional Convention there in Independence Hall. And he says, we have a terrible problem with the document we've drafted. We've given the power to the federal government through Congress to propose amendments if they deem them necessary, but we didn't give the same power to the people acting through the states. And he asks a question. Are we so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will ever propose amendments to restrain their own tyranny? I heard some people laugh out there. Anybody know of any tyrant that's ever said, ah, way too much power, I need to give you some of my power? It doesn't happen. So they've taken our power away gradually, and sometimes in big chunks. And sometimes it's about masks, and sometimes it's about vaccines, and sometimes it's about how you can use your property, and sometimes it's about how you're allowed, allowed to educate your kids. But we have come to this point that the founders knew would come where they have gone too far. And so he proposed the second clause of Article 5 for a time such as this. He was talking about federal tyranny. And they gave the states, they voted to give the states the power to call a convention to propose amendments, and they were talking about restraining federal tyranny. Is the federal government a tyranny? Yes. So the time has come. And the question for us is, do we as people have the fortitude of Levi Preston? Do you have the fortitude of Levi Preston? Yes. I think you do. That's what inspires me. That's why I'm out here doing what I'm doing. It's because you're out there doing what you're doing. And so they gave us this power. It takes 34 states to call a convention, two-thirds of states. I don't know if y'all heard the news. We got some news today. We've been at 15 states. Today, Wisconsin became state number 16. Nebraska's going to become state number 17, and we'll be halfway. You are on the march, and you are going to call a convention of states, and you are going to be the next generation of Levi Prestons that saves America. It's an incredible responsibility, though. I'm asking a lot from you. Sometimes people say, well, they don't ask that much of us, right? A few phone calls, come to a rally at the Capitol. I mean, the founders, they put their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on But us, we're just, that's not true. I'm asking a lot of you. I'm asking you to commit. I'm asking you to sacrifice. I see many in the audience who already have. And I'm asking you to keep sacrificing. Talk to your friends. Talk to your neighbors. Be in the fight. They will attack you. They will shame you. Today, I gotta, I mean, this is the way it goes. I gotta tell you, I, I was here today, I was at the cafeteria. One of our opponents is here. Uh, I don't know what he's trying to do, but he came up. He, he decided, he's comparing us, by the way, you'll love this. Apparently, we're all just like the Nazis. Now, I'm just gonna tell you, by the way, there's a guy who claims to be a conservative Christian. Uh, just to, for the record, make the record straight, I'm a Christian Jew. Both sides of my family are Jewish. 
and I accepted the Lord as my personal Savior. Literally, I got him on videotape. I asked him if he's willing to be taped, saying that we're like the Nazis. We're telling the big lie just like the Nazis. And I said, oh, like Gerbil? And he goes, no, you're more like Hitler. So you're going to hear this stuff. They're going to smear you. You're like Hitler. You're with Soros. Yeah, you're with the radical left. The truth is, you're Levi Preston. I'll stand with Levi Preston and against this guy, Robert Brown, or whoever he is, any day, any place. We're going to stand against those people, we're going to stand in faith, we're going to stand in love, and we're going to get this thing done, aren't we? Yeah. There are so many great volunteers that made this thing happen. And you have no idea how much work and planning went into this. I would say this is the most we've ever put into a rally in a state capital. That's how important your state is to us. That's how important we feel the state is. Iowa leads the nation. People look to Iowa. People watch what happens in Iowa. You guys know how it is in presidential elections? Everybody's watching what you do. And so we know that, and we believe in your state, and we believe that your state needs to lead, and that's why we put so much in. So to all the volunteers, to Karen and her whole team, to Catherine Zamonic, uh, who is your regional director, you guys, a, a big round of applause to all the volunteers. That made so in every legislature, there are people who serve, Lots of people who serve, and then there are some people who lead, who step up when it's not easy, who take on difficult tasks, who do things that people tell them, well, you shouldn't do that, you'll spend political capital, it'll be hard, people won't like you, it'll divide people. And thank God, in the legislatures, we have people who say, I don't care. I'm willing to do what it takes. I'm willing to stand. It's not an overstatement when I tell you that those people end up being my heroes. When I lay down to sleep at night, I thank God, my country, my family, health, for you, and for the state legislators that are willing to take a stand. It's not easy. They get a lot of abuse from taking a stand. So I want to introduce you to somebody who's become a friend, who's willing to take a stand for Convention of States, who's known for taking a stand. This is Representative Wills, who is the Speaker Pro Tem here. He's from House District 1, born and raised in Iowa, 25-year Army veteran. It's not a surprise, right? Retired as a first sergeant after doing several tours. He resides in Spirit Lake with his wife and three children. Please give a big round of applause to Representative Wills. 